Now, with a big hand to William Knight. Great. Okay. Wow, what a number. Fantastic. Loads of people turning up. It's good to be back here, actually. Yes, I'm excellent. Um, there's Sandy, by the way. If anyone. <laughs> She's your speaker in what, three weeks? Uh, yeah, four weeks. Fantastic. It's good to see lots of familiar faces. So yeah, as I was saying, um, good to be back in Gloucestershire. Um, moved away about three, three years ago, but uh, most of my life I've lived um, uh, on the edge of Mitch and Hampton Connell, um, some of it, Nailsworth, Avening. Um, but uh, yeah, so good, good to be back. Fantastic. Um, right, so my name is William. Um, no reason why you, you should know who I am, William Keat, um, and I seem to have been thrust upon the stage a little bit within the last three or four weeks um, <clears throat> to do with constitutional law. Um, it's always been my subject, or for a long time anyway. Um, let's go back a little bit. So originally, before I sort of woke up, as it were, um, that seems to be a key thing for us, isn't it? When did you wake up? Um, for me, it was probably around 2006, something like that. Actually, there's a gentleman in the front row who might remember that. But uh, anyway, um, it, was, it was basically around the time of uh, sort of looking into vaccinations for children and all that sort of stuff. And it was connected with Andrew Wakefield, um, all of that sort of stuff. And uh, looked into that. And then I moved pretty quickly after that um, into the subject of, of geopolitics and sort of parallel governing systems that sort of sit behind the scenes a bit. Um, uh, all of that relating to things like coup d'etats of, of, of how wars are set up, um, you know, agitation, getting into foreign governments, all of that sort of stuff across the world stage, that was a real interest of mine. Um, and how um, our traditional governing systems are sort of completely bypassed by other sort of parallel systems um, behind that. So things like the Rhodes Society, the Round Table Groups, the Fabian Society before that, that was a big sort of area of study for me. Um, really interesting. So I got into that in a big way, and that probably would have remained my passion um, had it not for the fact that I thought, I, actually, I need to stop looking at sort of symptoms. They're kind of causes, but actually, they're, you know, we all have our pet subjects. I went into sort of, you know, chemtrails and all that, all sorts of different things, you know. As how you do. Um, and, um, but eventually I thought, I, I need to look at the thing that is most likely to be the cause, at least, of our problems, uh, the manifestation of our problems at the moment, at least. Not at the deep level. Obviously, I realized that things were much deeper um, at a more esoteric and spiritual uh, level. But at least I, what I really needed to do was to tackle the thing that is causing the issue for us at the moment. And Really, that was law, because I thought, things are not right. There's Obviously, um, government is a bit out of line here, a bit. That's called the British <laughs> understatement. <laughs> um, and something's not right. There's got to be something in place that defines that set of standards. And, uh, and that's what I became interested in, really, was all of that. So I went on a whole journey to do with that. Um, so yeah, that was, that was basically me. I, I should have moved on the slide by this point, actually. Um, yeah, so who am I and what am I trying to do? So a little bit about what I'm trying to do now. It's that, really. I'm just getting into that now. <clears throat> um, so I'm connected, um, but not exclusively, because I do a lot of my own things too. I'm connected with the Hardwick Alliance for Real Ecology, or HARE, for short, H-A-R-E. Uh, so is Sandy, in fact, um, and a number of others. Justin Walker, who spoke uh, here about three weeks ago, or whatever it was, um, also. Um, it was founded by Sir Julian Rose um, at the Hardwick Estate, uh, just by the River Thames, uh, up there near Reading. Um, and it was really meant to be a sort of a, it sounds a bit pompous actually, it was sort of a think tank really, um, of like-minded people who are similarly awake but are quite deep into their subject. So we've got a mix of academics, historians, um, ecology experts, Sir Julian himself of course is what I would describe as a real green. Um, you, you, you've got a number of people, obviously Sandy, uh, who's an expert on the sort of the Great Reset and that side of things. And for me, it's really about constitutional law. And so this particular campaign that we sort of kicked off about a month ago um, is, is really about that. It's about raising awareness on constitutional law as 
really the set of standards by which we measure where government is stepping out of line, uh, because it's been completely missed. It's, uh, it seems to have been ignored, and, and um, that's uh, yeah, an important thing that we noticed. So something's not right. Um, our reality is not how we've been taught. Obviously, this is going back a bit. You guys woke up, uh, I'm sure, uh, to that. Um, otherwise, you probably wouldn't be sitting in here. Um, <clears throat> but I also want to make the point that uh, this is, this is a, a recurring theme throughout the evening, that our enslavement is really by the consensus thinking around us. Yeah, so we're, we're very much thinking about them and us, whoever them is, and we can describe that, but actually I think that's a bit of a, possibly not a waste of time, but it's a bit of a distraction, isn't it? Um, largely, in fact, um, and, and this is increasing, increasingly my theme, is that we've allowed the situation to get where it is at the moment today by incrementally, over time, allowing things to happen. So we are largely to blame for this. And the recognition of that is absolutely at the heart of what I think of as, as this, this movement. That's where we're going with this. Uh, and so what is that, the consensus? It's the sincere belief uh, in and the support of the status quo of those around us who are not in what we call this awake state. Okay, so that's, that's the problem we've got. We'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. So dangers of the current situation. I think we know that, but um, there's currently an insufficient resistance, I feel, uh, in, in the, what we would largely call the freedom movement, uh, moving away from calling it the truth movement. I think that's a bit arrogant, because it's quite often not the truth, what we, uh, perpetrate, what, what we, we talk about. Um, there's an insufficient resistance uh, against it, and it's usually because of a lack of focus. I think, on the cause, the causes, I'm sure there are many, but it, it's, we need to focus a bit more. Uh, I also want to talk about the possible deeper deceptions that many within the freedom movement might not have noticed. I'm not saying that it, this is the case, but it's, it's certainly my feeling and a number of others around me um, that there's, there's a deeper level to this, which you might call the great reveal. Okay, so what is that? It's the idea that, in fact, the whole bringing to the surface and the exposure um, of the sort of craziness to do with COVID and all of that, and how it all went very horribly wrong, and that the culpability uh, itself on ver of, of various actors uh, within the state is actually being brought to the sur surface, uh, almost in a rather inorganic way. It's possibly even being driven that way, possibly. Uh, and that's a kind of a slightly scary idea, that that, that that actually itself might be part of a plan uh, to expose that. Now, along with that, my feeling is that they're trying to destroy sovereign nations as well. So, because ultimately the, the end game is, is really global governance. Yeah, it's globalism. Yeah. And so if you can um, attack the, the nation states, then obviously that's a key thing. And um, that, that, I think, is a big part of that. And you might do that by attacking the royal family. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that you can, you can do that in delegitimizing what we once had as a nation state. Yeah, so if you're weakening the state, the, 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 the national governments, the, 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 the states that we have, and how they function, uh, and all the oaths of office, and that whole system that we have in place, if you can weaken that uh, and cause the people not to believe in it, uh, anymore, not to focus on it, not to understand it and value it, um, then, you know, you, you know where that's going. So uh, that, I think, is a big part of it. So the freedom movement, I've already said that, it's focusing on symptoms, um, but I think not the cause. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, you're seeing that I'm, I'm draw, drawing the conclusion already, um, but we'll, we'll go back on this, um, that it's really... We've got to hold on to our government. I know that sounds a bit odd. As long as it's functioning as it should. So it's like, no, you don't get away with a complete collapse. What we want to see is a properly functioning government in the way that you are supposed to be running. Yeah, they would like a complete collapse because it creates a massive vacuum, right? What we actually want, no, you don't get away with that. What we want is a return to lawful governance. 
Yeah? Now, if that weren't to happen, and there was a complete collapse, if you guys have learnt the absolutely underlying pillars that create a system of governance in society, that where you understand individual rights and you understand the key components of a democratic constitution, then if it does all collapse, at least you now know how the next system that you're going to create is, needs to be created. The danger that we have at the moment is that if they create a, a complete collapse, most people in this country have no idea what are the founding principles of freedom and how a society should be based on, how it, what it should be based on. Yeah, that's, that's the key. So either way, whatever happens, you still need to understand absolutely key principle, principles about your individual rights and common law and a system based on that. And there's, that's a good little conclusion to that page, is what the deep state really fear is constitutional governments. Okay, and yet, if you reflect on it now immediately, the freedom movement has almost completely ignored the constitution. If you think about it, whenever we've talked about common law, what do most people do? They go straight off and talk about admiralty law and start doing all sorts of processes in uniform commercial code, um, trusts, public and private, um, start talking about straw man, birth certificate fraud, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've been down that route. For years, I've, I've been into that stuff as well, like lots of people. It's funny, I'm getting emails every day. Oh, do you know about the straw man, Will? <laughs> yes, I do. I do know about it. Okay, But I'm afraid that my feeling is that it's actually very hard to prove to a high standard of proof. And in doing it, Two problems, you're making yourself look a bit clownish to the other side, and secondly, it's a bit dishonest in my view as well, because what you're doing is you're taking the spotlight off the fact that the government is behaving criminally over here in the, on, in the constitutional normal law, the conventional law, and you're travelling with them into their illegitimate system, which they've tricked us into, and then you're thinking it's okay to go and play them at their own games just because of your speeding fine or whatever it is. Sorry, I think that's dishonest, okay? And what we should be doing and should have been doing all of this time is holding the government to account under the Constitution. I don't care what you're doing over there in your faffing around with your admiralty systems. I know you're doing stuff. And I know the principles and I know what's probably going on. I'm not interested. You're going to have to unpick all of that and it will be fun to watch. Okay? But I'm going to hold you to account over here, along with hundreds of thousands and hopefully millions of others as well. See what I mean? You're not letting them get away with it. Okay? By messing around in their systems, I think we are getting, letting them get away with it. And that's my contention. Okay? Right, so let's get on with it then. Let's, uh, let's get into the essentials of what it is. Uh, or what, or what a, um, an individual rights-based constitutional system is all about. So if we go back to the beginning a little bit, we need to talk about individualism versus collectivism. All these isms. God, this is not going to be an easy evening for you. Okay, so by the way, we are going to have a break. I think we decided. I mean, otherwise, we're going to get... Uh, you know me with my passion. It'll just go... It'll go on and on and on without me. When did we start? About ten minutes ago. Don't worry about the time. Okay, so we'll aim to sort of uh, pause and have, let you guys have a drink at about, uh, I don't know, 10 past or something like that. Great. Right, individualism, individualism versus collectivism. Now, this is the key to it. <clears throat> this is all about the difference between two opposite ideologies. If any of you have um, studied any of the Mark Passio material, in nat with natural law and, and other things. You'll, you'll be familiar with this. Now, one of the things that he says is that, the, that most of the sort of the opposites in society, uh, where we're, we're divided, you know, by age, sex, you know, all, all the different things that they kind of cause problems with in society, divide and rule. All of those things are, fi are fictions. You know, they're not true. Okay, but there is one thing, there is one divide that is absolutely real in the universe. 
and it's the two ideologies of individualism and collectivism. So we'll, we'll get into that now. So, free thinking and free will. What do I mean by that? That is the fundamental um, aspect of the individual in the universe. At the divine level, we are free-thinking individuals and we have free will. Okay, and we'll get on to free will in a minute, but what that really is, is we have the free will to, to go in alignment with natural law, that's the laws of the universe, to be in alignment with it, or, or not, as the case may be. Okay? Uh, we have that, that freedom. And we're also fundamentally self-determining, and we're interested in our self-improvement. And it's from that that we get fulfilment. There's a kind of meaning to our lives, ultimately, at the individual level, because we get some kind of fulfilment from the fact that we are self-determining and we're interested in, in a general um, idea of us sort of, you know, making tomorrow better than today kind of thing. Um, it's, it's that idea. But we've been taught that individualism... Is, is, it, is it perhaps selfish, or it's at least been suggested to us that you're just thinking about yourself? Okay, and we need to be aware that that isn't the case, because as individualists, we recognise that other people, and we delight in other people's successes as individuals as well. Yeah? yeah. So we want the best for others. And that proves that as an individualist, we are given our freedom, and therefore others must have their freedom too. Yeah, this is absolutely fundamental to, to all of this. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to others. And this is where we get into the masculine and the, the, the feminine idea already. We're, we're going to be returning to that all through the evening. Okay, because the responsibility to ourselves is sort of a masculine expression, because what it is, is it's about our boundaries. Yeah, whereas the reaching out to, to others and engaging and the pulling in is, is more the feminine. And we need an integration of both. I tend not to describe it as a balance, because a balance is where you, you travel from one end of the balance scale uh, and you move towards the other, you're losing what you had over here where, as you move that way. I don't like to think of it as a balance. I like to think of it as an integration of these things. Yeah, we're integrating these things together. Okay, so we need a responsibility to ourselves as well as to others. Now, the responsibility to ourselves is about the fact that you can't really function as a um, human being in society or in a community unless you've dealt with your own needs. Yeah, and this is in a way about our own health. It's not our physical health, just that. It's also about our mental health and our emotional health. You can't support other people effectively unless you've dealt with your own stuff and your own health and your own needs, getting into kind of like healing and trauma here. Okay, this is going to get quite deep tonight. Okay, so, and, and this is key, absolutely key, because this is going to go deep, this stuff. Yeah, it's ultimately all about that, really. So, voluntary action uh, is, is all about what, what it is when we co-create with others, okay? And it makes us feel good. It only makes us feel good when it's voluntary. So, when you interact with others in a group, it's, when you do it under your own volition, it's fantastic. Because a few of you have come together and you're working together as a team and you're producing more than the sum of its parts, it's like when you trade and just two people trade, yeah? It's, it's not just benefit, it's not like two plus two and you get four, it's like two plus two and you get like 50. Yeah, it's when two people come together, they're, they're sort of, the, the, the benefit of working together or trading together or whatever it is, you get this amplification effect, synergistic effect, yeah? And that is the abundance that comes together when individuals come together voluntarily as individuals, yeah, as opposed to being coerced in a group, which we'll come on to in a minute. So, conscience. Now, this is interesting because it's, we have a conscience at the individual level. It's all about the individual. 
Okay, we have our moral rudder is built in to us individually and we're able to exercise that. Okay, it's slightly, I know it's kind of slightly coming out of the subject, but it's related because we're seeing the fact that, that we have these abilities, these divine abilities built into us. Now, the conscience is interesting because we all have it and we don't learn it as adults. We have a conscience even when we're very young children as well. Okay, and, and you see that, don't you, in children's behaviour, you know, when one child takes a toy away from another child and there's the complete misery and hurt. Yeah, there's a, there's a, you can see it in the, in, in the sort of the reaction of the young child, that it, there's something wrong about what has happened. They've been absolutely damaged, you know, in that moment. Yeah? And that conscience is in there, it's built in. It's something divine and natural uh, within all of us. Okay, now what's interesting, though, about that, you can see where I'm going with this, is that that conscience functions the same in all of us. We have it individually, but it functions the same. We all know when something is wrong, we, we can recognise right behaviour and wrong behaviour when we see it. And, and, and in fact, we, we recognise it in ourselves. And that's the uncomfortable feeling, isn't it? When we haven't done something right that we should have done or whatever it is. Yeah, that's the pricking sensation that, you know... So that's what the conscience is. Now that means that there must be some kind of absolute morality in the universe. It's built in. Sorry, but you're not allowed to narcissist, are you? Should we do that at the end? Do you, do you want to ask me questions at the end, just so that I could keep that one, keep the flow going? That would be great. So the morality is, there must be some kind of absolute morality in the universe. Because there's a, a set of standards that we all seem to have consistently. We recognise it. Okay. Now, what we're actually aiming for is the sovereign being being a self-master. Now, what that is, is anarchy. Because what we really want is because we have that conscience built into us, that means that we can deal with it ourselves. We don't need an external suggestion of what is right and what is wrong. Assuming that our sense of right behaviour and wrong behaviour is absolutely key within us. And we've finally attuned that consciousness. Okay, I'm not suggesting that the current state of affairs in our society is okay on that. Okay, we've got a deeply messed up consciousness in society, I would argue. Okay, so things are, things are not right, certainly. But that's what you're aiming for, is that sovereign being as a self-master. And that's what we mean by, in a sense, in that context as anarchy. There are different etymologies of the word anarchy, which I won't go into at the moment. But one of those is, is um, uh, no external rulers, without external rulers, because we can, we can do this for ourselves. We have responsibility. Yeah? And we're also dealing with... Uh, this is, of course, bringing in the subject of equity and inequity. Okay, so... Um, this is to, basically to do with the fact that we are all equal in our community. It doesn't matter what level you're at, we are all to be treated equally under the law. That is equity, in the plain English sense. I'm not talking about the kind of law called equity, which is sometimes a bit of a distraction. Okay, what I'm talking about here is, um, is just the plain English sense of equity as opposed to inequity. Now, that actually translates into a number of other things. So if we have, we're going back to individualism and collectivism here, because in a way, it's the left side and the right-hand side, and I've often presented it like this. Okay, so think of all the things that are to do with individualism on the left-hand side, and all the things to do with collectivism on the right-hand side. Now, collectivism is the group expression when you haven't understood that the group is a group of individuals. If you're understanding that the group is a group of individuals that have come together voluntarily, then you're an individualist. Working together voluntarily in a group, fine. But what we're seeing increasingly is the collectivist idea, which is that you don't get to choose 
as an individual, we're going to decide that you are in this group and you are labelled like this. That's not voluntary. That's involving coercion. That's involving an external authority. Okay, and then that's going to lead us on to understanding about order following and things like that, which we'll come on to. Okay, so what are the other expressions of equity and inequity? So it's going to be things like fairness and justice on the left-hand side, and obviously the opposite of that on the right-hand side. Um, you decide what is good for you. To de- that's, that's the individualist. Yeah, but the, the collectivist version of that is someone else decides what's good for you. These are the kinds of expressions that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, as an individualist, you want freedom, but the individualist will want freedom for the collectivist as well. But the collectivist will not agree with that, and they want to control you. <laughs> so, yeah. So you're wanting a fairness on both sides, but yeah. Um, so you get freedoms if they grant it to you. Um, freedom of speech as an individualist, but the collectivist will say you, you, you can say what they allow you to say. Which rather reminds me of my little incident with GB News and, and then all the stuff that came out of it afterwards in the following week. So we, we, were, we were sort of connected to kind of anti-Semitism and all of that kind of stuff. So as soon as they throw that sort of label at you... Yes, you know you're on to the... All right. So we're talking on the left-hand side with individualism, we're talking about inalienable rights. What's that? Inalienable rights is, is rights that you are born with. That's rights that you just have by the very fact that you're living. Yeah? Um, and, of course, the collectivist version of that on this side is uh, you have rights that we provide, you give, that, that we give you. Yeah, and that means that if they can give you those rights, they can take them away again. Yeah. So we have to be a bit careful about um, human rights, because human rights, I think, is connected with the United Nations, and that's a term that's been used with that. Okay, so individual rights is what you're talking about, or inalienable rights. That's what's connected to this philosophy over here on the left-hand side. Okay. <laughs> so what's the? So let's get into that. So what is? What we're really talking about here is the relationship between the people and some organisation to support their living. That's really what we're talking about. Okay, we've got the people who live in... And it, by the way, it doesn't have to be a country. It doesn't have to be a nation. It could be a, a, a village somewhere. It could be a town. It could be, it could be a, the, the village in, in South America, in the middle of the Amazon. It's exactly the same principle. Yeah? You've got the people, and you've got... Some people, maybe, who are going to be providing, some kind of organisation that are going to provide the support to those people in some fashion. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And the, the key question is, is it that the people are in authority over that organisation that's supporting their living? Or is it the other way around? But that that organisation that's supposed to be supporting the, the people's living, it's actually an authority over them. Isn't that the key question? Yeah. That's what it's all about, actually, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. You know, if we're going to start talking about the Constitution and about our governing system, that's really the key question. Now, people sense that there is something wrong with government, but they can't express what that is. Yeah, up until recently... Uh, up until about a month ago, <laughs> we started clarifying these issues. People, you know, we would say, well, what's the constitution? What is a constitution? What is it? What, you know, how does the government work? And, of course, loads of people in the country, very great number of people in the country, just don't, they, they wouldn't be able to answer that question. I couldn't answer that question either about six, seven years ago. Um, and that's why I thought I'd probably better get into this, you know. Um, and this is the problem we've got, because most of the population therefore do not understand the governing system in this country and how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> so the, the, the central issue is, what's the original setup? How was it set up to work? 
Okay, so we've got the limits of a governing system. Is it A, tyranny, because you've got the governments in authority, in which case anything goes, frankly. Uh, or you've got B, the people are in authority. It's one or the other. There isn't a middle ground anywhere. And you'll see in a minute when we quote Lysander Spooner, one of the key uh, people in this subject, um, you'll see that he uh, articulates this absolutely brilliantly. So if the framework was set up correctly, then people need to know what that is. And that thing that we're talking about there, that framework, to decide which way it goes, is the Constitution. That's what it is. And if you don't know that the Constitution was set up to make you the authority over the government, which is really just an administration, as opposed to the other way around, then it's, it's got to be the central issue, isn't it? Of your life, in a sense, because you're living in that community, in that society. If the government thinks it's an authority over you, that's going to create a very different situation in your life to the other way around, okay? So... That's what it is. That's what we're defining, is the Constitution. It's the Constitution that basically defines the relationship of the government to its people. And it's also going to define the limitations um, defining government crime. It's the limitations placed on government. Because what that's basically saying is, government is legitimate up to this point. Beyond that point, it's illegitimate. It, it delegitimizes itself by going beyond. It's acting criminally. <clears throat> so, the government above the people or the people in authority over government. The balance of power. Oh, it says, quote Spooner. I think that means that I'm going to read this out to you. There we go. So, the authority to judge what are the powers of the government and what are the liberties of the people must necessarily be vested in one or other of the parties themselves, the government or the people, because there is no third party to whom it can be entrusted. If the authority be invested in the government, the government is absolute and the people have no liberties except such as the government sees fit to indulge them with. If, on the other hand, that authority be vested in the people, then the people have all liberties, as against the government, except such as substantially the whole people, through the jury, we can see where that's going, choose to disclaim, and the government can exercise no power except such as substantially the whole people, through the jury, consent that it may exercise. Lysander Spooner. Brilliant essay. Essay on Trial by Jury, 1852. It's available online, read it, it's brilliant, absolutely superb. Um, now that's key, consent. You know how everybody says, oh, it's the consent of the governed and all that. That's how it's done, coming on to that in a minute, it's through the jury. Yeah. So the limits on government, let's get into that a little bit more. So the people over the government... Um, the limitations on, on the government is about defining the set of standards in which government can operate. The people themselves can define their own liberties and standards by which they wish to live by. Now that's really powerful, putting it like that, isn't it? Yeah, the people get to define the their own liberties and the standards by which they wish to live by. These are the kinds of phrases you just, you're going to have to have them at your fingertips. Okay, sounds a bit highbrow, but you know, it's not difficult, this stuff. Yeah, so we're defining things. And what we're describing here is a system of true democracy. Okay, that's democracy, that's the true meaning of democracy. Okay, the people rule. Demos and kratia, to rule. Kratain is the verb, to rule. Okay, from the Greek, the two Greek words. That's what democracy means. You don't get to rule by voting in your representatives. That's not ruling, the people ruling. 
Okay? So they've done a bit of a twist on this, haven't they? You know how it is in the freedom movement. People say, oh, no, no, you don't want democracy because that's just awful. It's a... No, we do want democracy. It's just that they've con confused you as to what it means. Okay, democracy is basically where the people actually decide on their own liberties. And, and the key to it is the mechanism by which that's done. Okay, it's not about voting in elections, democracy. That's what we're told. That is adult suffrage. <clears throat> Here's another quote from that great man, Lysander Spooner. Again, an essay on trial by jury, same essay, I like that one. Any government that is its own judge of and determines authoritatively for the people what are its own powers over the people is an absolute government, of course. It has all the powers it chooses to exercise. There is no other, or at least no more accurate, definition of a despotism than this. On the other hand, any people that judge of and determine authoritatively for the government what are their liberties against the government retain all the liberties they wish to enjoy. And this is freedom. So that's the system in society where you get to be an anarchist. Because what you're basically saying is the government gets out of the way and it allows us to run our lives. Sounded good. Right, suffrage and majority consensus. Okay, now what we've just been talking about is individualism. Yeah, it's a system based on individual rights. Now we're going to look at the other side, the collectivism. Okay, and what this is really all about is voting in elections, suffrage, and majority consensus. So let's just explore that a little bit. So, nature of truth discovery, the path. What on earth do I put that up for? I can't remember, anyway. Oh, I see, yes, I know. I, right, okay. So what this is really about is, is about getting to truth. Okay, and getting to truth is quite often un, an uncomfortable process. Truth isn't always good news. A lot of times, truth is bad news, especially now. Okay. Now... Does the, the majority in the country exercise a courage to face difficult truth? No. So you can see where that's going, okay? We've got an, an uncomfortable path to getting to truth, and sometimes it's, it's laziness is a problem as well, okay? So what you're, you're basically saying is that most people will arrive at some opinion about something through a laziness and a lack of courage, which means that they'll probably be wrong. <laughs> the majority reach a position more quickly, but do so through a lack of discipline, rigour and courage. In other words, it's the minority, often, who can face the truth and take a bit longer over it, take a bit more trouble, a bit more courage, Etc. See where that one's going. And I just said that. The minority are often closer to the truth in their understanding. They've arrived at a more carefully considered position. And yet we have a system of governance that rewards the lazy majority who have applied less consideration. Okay, so our entire system of governance now, adult suffrage, is based on that. Collectivism. That's what we've got in place. The Constitution doesn't use suffrage. Okay, it, actually it does use it for, for electing people into office at a lower level. Okay. Um, but it's, it, what it actually uses is something much more incisive and fair. And that's what we're coming on to, of course, isn't it? <coughs> Voting is all about giving grown adults the illusion of control. It's an illusion. Yeah? <clears throat> now, the other interesting thing there is that referenda is not constitutional either. 
Okay, a lot of people say, oh, the fairest system would be to do what Switzerland do and just have um, everybody, the entire country, voting on a policy. It's just, it's just more majority, it's more consensus. It's exactly the same thing, but worse. <laughs> it's adult suffrage on steroids. Okay, so uh, what we're actually saying here is um, it's referendum is not constitutional versus jury. And I've got here justice laboratory. I described it as that in the statement that you can download. It's the first thing that you hit on commonlawconstitution.org on the website. First thing that you hit is my, I think it's about a 13-page statement that I wrote, which is the beyond the sort of five steps to understanding the Constitution. It's a bit more than that. It's like, I want something a bit more solid. It's got some quotes. It's got some good references in it, academic references. That's what you need to read. I've written it quite simply and straightforwardly. Yeah, it's not flowered up in academic language. Yeah, it's about 13 pages and it deals with all of this stuff. Okay, but you should, you should read that. But in that, I talk about the fact that the jury is all about a justice laboratory. Okay, it's basically, unlike this over this side, it's taking a, a real individual, a real man or woman, and looking at the effects of the piece of legislation that brought them into court, and it's balancing the two of them together. It's looking at the effects on that man and what happened, and looking at the, at the context, it's looking at the, uh, the motivations, all of that that went on, the state of mind. Okay, we'll get into this in a minute, called mens rea in Latin. Yeah, and it's, it's weighing that up against the piece of legislation that brought him in. And it's looking at those two together, as a package. Do you think you get that in a, in a referenda? Somebody whimsically saying, do you think it's a good idea that in this country we do this, that and the other? Come on. Yeah? I think there's a difference in standard there. How are we doing for time? You're all right. Right, mechanisms of the Constitution. You kind of know this because you've been paying attention for the last three or four weeks, uh, or a lot longer. So, the English Common Law Constitution, trial by jury. Uh, this is all about what I described on, on that evening with Neil Oliver as the, the concealed second purpose of trial by jury. So the first purpose, everybody in the country knows what the first purpose of the, of the jury is, which is to judge on the accused. Are they guilty or are they not guilty? Yeah. But I've just hinted at that, haven't I? It's actually about the hidden second purpose which is the fact, and I think I described it as that on that programme actually, is that the piece of legislation that comes in with them is also on trial. Okay, no, nobody thinks of it like that, okay. That was actually, Ken, um, I think that was Ken Doodney that said that. It's brilliant, great way of putting it. Okay, so that's the concealed second purpose in trial by jury, is to judge on the justice of the legislation that brought the man into court. And you need to start thinking about the profound implications of that. Okay? Now, we're talking about jury independence. And you can see I've put slash annulment by jury. And the reason for that is because it's sometimes quite difficult to know whether it's going to result in an actual annulment. Annulment basically means that it's really quite obvious from the decision of the jury... Because we all know the facts. He did break the law, but there's no other circumstances that it could be it's quite obvious that the jury returned a not guilty verdict in that situation because they disagreed with the legislation. It's not always easy to know that for sure. Okay? And because of that, it's really less about annulment, although that can happen and does happen and still happening today. It's more about jury independence. So thanks to um, Clay Conrad um, in America, because great book actually, I'll tell you about that later. Um, but he, he was using the term more generally, jury independence. And I like that term because it's really all about that. It's about the fact that the jury has an independent decision of government legislation. Now that is a really unpopular concept in the establishment. They really don't want us talking about that. Alexis de Tocqueville described the jury as a political institution 
embodying the sovereignty of the people. And the very best way of preparing a people to be free. Now, what's interesting about that is that we're starting to get the teaching element coming in. It's the fact that actually being on a jury will actually cause your consciousness to raise. The more we engage in these mechanisms of the Constitution, the more we raise our consciousness. So you can see we've gone way off course, and the more off course we've gone, the worse it's got. It's accelerated it. Yeah, because the Constitution has built within it mechanisms that keeps us engaged in these matters. That's why I keep going on about this and how profound and important the Constitution is. I don't just talk about it because I'm some law geek. I go, I go on about this precisely because philosophically and deeply at an esoteric level, this is a really profound issue for the country, for any society. <clears throat> Churchill, on the importance of trial by jury, the power of the executive to cast a man into prison without formulating any charge known to the law, and particularly to deny him the judgment of his peers, is in the highest degree odious. <coughs> you can imagine him saying it, can't you? <coughs> and is the foundation of all totalitarian government, whether Nazi or communist. That was Churchill. Okay, so all of our, what I've been talking about on commonlawconstitution.org, all of this stuff, is all backed up by actually relatively <laughs> recent people. Key people. And really, all that's happening is that the establishment has just tried to airbrush this out gradually. Well, it's not actually been that gradual in the last 40, 50 years. Do you know, honestly, about, about 40, 40 years ago, maybe... <laughs> The establishment, you would get politicians in the political class, although they were a bit coy about it, they would actually admit when you ask them things like, can government do what it likes? And they would answer, well, technically, no, of course it can't. You, know, you would get these, these answers coming back. They would actually say it. Now, it's a very different matter. To the extent, of course, that if you go on the Parliament website, it actually says, oh, Parliament's sovereign. We're the top of the tree. And it's just wrong. It's just completely incorrect. How have we got to that situation? That they're just, they're either lying or they're so out of whack with their understanding, and I suspect it's more the second, actually. You just don't have very capable people at the top. Far less capable than you might think. But you have that mixed with arrogance. And that's the worst combination, is people who are not actually that capable but they're just arrogant. So, the head of state, because this is another important mechanism. The head of state and the, th and the tree of oaths. So we know where that is. So this is the crown in its organic sense, not I'm talking about the crown corporation. Forget that for the moment. I'm talking about the, the, the crown under the constitution. Um, is the head of state um, or... Uh, the first among equals, I like to call them. Okay, and underneath that we have a whole tree of oaths that are taken. So, pre-1215 common law, we're talking about um, way before even 1215 Magna Carta, uh, which we're always talking about, we're going to that. Um, and we're talking about the Saxon tradition, and then going back into Europe, uh, and even uh, 200 years uh, before Magna Carta itself, you had the same thing being expressed by Emperor Conrad in Germany, in Europe. Which is interesting, isn't it, given the fact that we're used to thinking that most of the European nations uh, function under Napoleonic law, which is a sort of a form of canon, um, canon law, uh, not, not common law. They're not common law nations now. They should be, but they were then. Most of Europe was under common law. So under the Constitution, the king or queen is not all-powerful. Now, this is really central, this, because we've got a big Republican movement going on, haven't we? Okay, oh, we just need a president. That will sort everything out. Will it? Really. 
Okay, you look around the world at the various republics, and uh, I don't see anything any better at all. It's nothing to do with that. It's not really to do with the style of the head of state. Because in a republic, the style of the head of state is a president. Okay, in a, um, in a monarchy, it's a king or queen, but the key to this is the fact that we are a limited monarchy. That's different. Okay, that's basically where you have a wise elder running things who's well respected and they can be removed if they step out of line and they delegitimize themselves because there are functions built into the constitution that cause them to delegitimize themselves when they go outside law. Yeah? So we call him the, a king or a, we call it a king or a queen and everybody thinks oh it's terrible in England because we have a monarchy. Yeah? But you know the whole common law system is actually English. <laughs> So we've got a bit of confusion going on here. Is it good or isn't it? You know? And nobody's really asking themselves that. Yeah? But it is good because the king or queen thing is limited, fundamentally. So think of King Alfred. King Alfred was a, was a well-respected man. Yeah? I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm just, you know, that's more the kind of thing. King Alfred, Edgar, Edward the Confessor, those late Saxon kings um, were fantastic in what they were doing. They were putting the ancient laws and customs together um, and driving things in the right direction, definitely. It was later that things went badly wrong. So here we go. David Hume, historian, English historian, the king, so far from being invested with arbitrary power, was only considered as the first among the citizens. His authority depended more upon his personal qualities than on his station. He was even so far on a level with the people that a stated price was fixed for his head and a legal fine was levied upon his murderer, which, though proportionate to his station and superior to that paid for the life of a subject, was a sensible mark of his subordination to the community. Interesting. Yeah? Plenty more like that where that came from. So, the historical foundation... How far can we go back? Ancient Hellenic constitution, Greece. It's quite a long way. Okay, and it was uh, really in the time of the aristocrat, interestingly. The aristocrat, Cleisthenes. Okay, not later on. Plato, Socrates, that's when things started to go wrong, actually. And we're talking about exousia rights, which comes from the Greek word, word authority. Okay, and, and we talked about that. Democratia, demos and Kratia, the people rule. Okay, that's where it comes from. And what is it all about? It's all about the citizens being the final arbiter of law. Defining their liberties. It's the people that define their liberties. Well, can you say what exousia means? Authority. Authority. Yeah. <laughs> Quotes. Let's say, just put quotations. It's not very good, is it? <coughs> Uh, okay, so here's Gilbert, another um, historian. The jury were the judges, and judged both law and fact, is what this is all about. No cause of consequence was determined without the king's writ. For even in the county courts, of the debts which were above 40 shillings, there issued a justices, a commission, to the sheriff to enable him to hold such a plea, where the suitors, that's the jurors, are judges of the law and fact. Now, the reason why that's important, that quote, is because the, the establishment and the judiciary will tell you that the jury are the judges of the fact and the law is left to the judge. Okay, and if I haven't, I haven't already explained that, I should have put that in there. <clears throat> this is one of the distortions over time, is that the judge, back then when oper operating under proper common law, was not a judge. They were a convener. Okay, so that was all about the proceedings, running the proceedings. And, uh, and might have been an expert in law, not necessarily, and they would have been able to advise the jury if, if they got something important and useful to say, and often they did. And the jury were able to take that on board if they wanted to. But they didn't have to. So there was no directing going on. It is not for an employee of the state to direct the jury, which is really in a way what the judiciary has become, because they're meant to be a separate branch, but they're not properly. Okay, so 
that's an important quotation. Um, the nobility were absolutely dependent upon the wholehearted assent of the, of the armed common men, generally called free men, or freeholders of their neighbourhood. The majority of the male population were known as free men. Without their support, the nobility were impotent. Now that's important. Why? Because we often get the claim that, oh, Magna Carta was all about the barons. No, it wasn't. The barons were vassals to the king, had to pay taxes. The lands they held were crown lands. Okay, and they could only run them through an arrangement with the local people. There was a kind of a, a quid pro quo. There was a relationship there that was important. Yeah. Now, the other important thing is that um, because the word free man is used in Magna Carta, later on, I think it was 1483, there was some legislation that was introduced that changed the meaning of the word free man to a land owner. And that's one of the reasons why people say oh, it's all about landowners. No. All common men were uh, free, free men. So that's important. So I'm going to... Uh, no, let's just do the summary quickly. Historical summary, the rule of law. This is important. So we'll, then we'll stop. Okay. So the genuine rule of law is, uh, oh, it hasn't come up point by point. Oh, well, you've got to see everything now for the next three minutes. <laughs> doesn't matter, we'll go through it. So the genuine rule of law is what we started with, with the common law constitution operating properly. And, and, and just to describe that again, basically the people decide on the moral framework of their community or society through the jury. All courts, by the way, all courts back in... Um, medieval England back in the feudal English time. Isn't it interesting how we've been told that feudal England was a terrible time for... No, I don't think it was. I think that's all part of the dressing up that's gone on. Okay, all the courts that went on back then, so that's the county court, the court leet, the court baron, there were various different court type courts. Um, they were all trials by jury. All of them. And the people on the jury were the common man. So, they, de they decide on the moral framework of their community. They do that through the jury. That's a natural law tribunal. Okay, because it's tapping into your conscience. The minutiae of people's lives is not defined or prescribed, and certainly not by government. And that's the key. So, what were, what were they actually doing in the courts? They were basically just deciding on whether somebody was harmed or not wasn't anything to do with, we're going to have a policy that does this, 15-minute cities. You can't go to that, that village um, 15 minutes away in your horse and cart. Uh, we're not having any of that kind of stuff. Okay, you, you, can't, you have to have a license to have this. No, that kind of thing is not part of government. It's not what government is there for. It's not there to do that. What it's, it, it's only there to assist in the running of this. So that meant that we had a more open landscape of freedom. It was not prescriptive. Very few statutes, and this is the key, the statute doesn't have the power to punish. If you think about it, there's another line. It's quite useful. Write that one down as well. Okay? Statutes can't punish by themselves. What are they actually doing? In a proper common law system, what they're actually doing is flagging up Okay, because you've set a certain standard to kind of flag up something that we're a bit worried about here. You know? Um, so he needs to be brought before a court, before a jury. How's the punishment actually happening? It's the jury. It's the jury that gets to punish. It's not the statute. Yeah? The statute is about just setting a sort of an arbitrary standard and saying that at that point we're a bit concerned about this guy. If he's doing that, you know, fine. And that might be quite sensible. Okay, so very few statutes and they can't punish. Now, the fake rule of law. So that's the one we've got today. And it all morphed into this 
really a, a, through a, probably about 100 years, sort of from the mid-1600s, maybe early 1600s actually, to the mid-1700s when we had the birth of our modern political system with parties. So the Tories and the Whigs. That was the sort of emergence of the political system. Yeah? So the, that genuine rule of law was gradually covered up and distorted through confusion and obfuscation. And trial by jury was weakened incrementally, done by all sorts of things, you know, like deciding who can be on a jury, all of that kind of stuff. It was replaced by a system of governance based on voting in the majority. Statutes can now punish. Intent is ignored. Jury trial is removed for an awful lot of cases. No longer based on principle. And it's all about order following. And I'm going to go into that in just a sec, about order following. Okay? But that's really what we've... That's our governing system that we now call democracy. Okay. Has actually, it's actually replaced that older, more direct system where the people are essentially defining their liberties. Yeah? So, order following, very quickly. Um, we've got um, three sort of layers of order following going on in society. We've got um, the people follow orders themselves in the case of statutes. If you think about it, we're following orders, aren't we, with statutes? Okay? Uh, we'll come on to what order following is in a moment. Um, the jury are taking directions from the judge. So the jury are following orders as well. Okay, and then of course we've got the, um, the executive and the military. The police and the military um, are following orders as well. Now what's the big deal about following orders? What it means is that you are suspending your moral faculty as a human being. It's utterly immoral, immoral to follow orders, always. Okay, this is a line that I always like to use. There's no virtue in doing what you're told. Yeah, this is why I love memes. Because these are the kinds of sentences that get people thinking, whoa, that's quite shocking. Kind of creates a sort of short circuit in the brain. We're going to come on to that kind of stuff later. Because we're going to have to crack this consciousness in, in those out there with a statist mindset, with a, with a collectivist mindset. Yeah? But order following is never moral. Okay? It might be that what they are suggesting you should do might be a really good idea, but you consider it. And then you think, yeah, that's a good idea, I'm going to do that. Absolutely. Or no, I'm not. But it's always about following your moral conscience. I think that's it for that section. Yeah, let's go on to that later. Let's have, uh, let's have a drink. Right, you horrible lot. Sit down, get on with it. Right, here we go. It's just like being a teacher again. I love it. I miss those days. Okay. The healing power of the Constitution. I hinted at that, didn't I, earlier? So that's what we're going to tackle next. <clears throat> okay, juries. The raising of consciousness. So I did, uh, did hint at this. Being a juror is all about conscience. Testing for that absolute morality. Morality is therefore not relative okay and that is by the way a satanic sin it's one of the top ones in satanism actually um, is uh, moral relativ relativity okay so you get if you think you get to make up what's right and wrong behaviour in the universe if you think you can do that you're a satanist technically that's not me saying it, it's, it's according to the description of the tenets of Satanism. It's one of the top ones. Okay, morality is not relative. Under natural law, you discover that certain behaviours in the universe will result in certain consequences. Okay, natural law is sometimes termed moral consequentialism. As a juror, we may have to face our own prejudices and inner lies about ourselves. It says video there. Gosh, I'd forgotten there was a video coming up. I wonder if... Actually, I might... No, I'm not going to play it. I'm just going to suggest in a minute that uh, you, you go away and do your homework on that um, and watch a, a good film. 
Um, you know what, which one that is, I'm sure. Um, is that the next thing? No. So why is that? Because you are forced to be in a room until the job is done. Okay, and sometimes that job is difficult and unpleasant, and it causes you to, it causes all kinds of things to come up, emotionally and psychologically, for the for the juries. Yeah, and that means that there's a healing process that's taking place, not only in the court, maybe, but with the with the defendant, but probably in the jurors as well. So the whole process is just riddled with healing aspects. That's the nature of natural law. Natural law uh, is all about right and wrong behaviour. Okay, and rights are often defined in the apophatic, meaning in the negative. Okay, and that, what that means actually, just a little bit uh, more specifically on that, is that you're defining something by saying what it isn't. Okay, that's what we mean by apophysis, or putting something in the apophatic. So what's the point of that? Because you notice that in the Ten Commandments, which isn't really all natural law, it's just some of it, um, is about what you shouldn't do to others. Yeah? So often it's... And the reason for that, of course, is that you're leaving... Remember I said earlier about how um, government is, is, is not... Or the Constitution is not defining what you can do so much. It's defining what you can't do meaning that everything else is okay. It's the bigger, freer landscape that is, is left to you, and we're just defining by exception. Yeah, and that's powerful. So the, the, the concept of apophysis is actually quite a, um, an esoteric concept, and it's part of the um, occulted body of knowledge, which we're, we're going to come on to a little bit later. Okay, but that's a, a, quite an interesting uh, point, that one. <coughs> Quotations. Oh, here we go. <coughs> Juries, raising of consciousness. So, Trevor Grove, in a book called The Juryman's Tale, we had become professionalised. They say the office helps to make the man. Even within the much briefer compass of most trials, jury membership does seem to summon up people's civic mindedness, perhaps for the first and only time in their lives. Although this is a cynical age, Honesty, fairness and justice are concepts nearly everyone believes in, even if they do not personally live up to them. Which is really interesting, that last bit, because it might be that their own lives are in a right mess. But does that mean that when they get on the jury, they can't do a good job? No. no. Because they're in a safe place, they're in a safe position, they're judging somebody else. But they're still reflecting on their own stuff. And at the same time, what is it doing? It's healing themselves. You may find that somebody comes out of being on, an, on jury service and they start to turn their lives around through a really profound experience that they've... Where, I mean, not every time you go on a jury, it's profound and amazing. And, you know, it might actually just be really... Not, it might be a clear-cut case that this guy absolutely... It was really clear that he's guilty, in which case, you know... But I'm sure that there's always, to some extent, some interesting stuff that you're going to have to go through. <clears throat> so here's Grove again. Uh, also said, his jury seemed to have common sense, good humour, scepticism and patience. And in my view, it was the jury system itself, the fact that we were forced to act together in this rather daunting undertaking that helped bring these qualities to the fore. Really interesting stuff. And of course, what's happening, of course, in our society today, it's quite often the case that the jury is sort of... It's kind of weird. You get this kind of gaslighting going on, where in one sense, oh, the jury is such an important part of our system. And yet also, at the same time, they'll, they'll denigrate the jury. Oh, no, jurors... The people are just not conscious enough to be on the jury. It's just awful, you know. And you'll, you'll get a bit of both going on. And it creates this kind of confusion and gaslighting. Yeah, but in actual fact, this is really interesting, and there's quite a bit of research uh, that suggests that people become much more civically minded when they've been on a jury, because it involves this raising of consciousness. And here's the film um, <coughs> that we're talking about here, 
12 Angry Man. It will try and play, actually, in a minute, probably, but I'm not going to do it because it needs to be mic'd up and stuff, and we're not here to just watch a film. Um, <clears throat> but that's your homework. I'll probably give you a lot more homework, actually, but that's one, one of your things. Go, go and watch 12 Angry Men. <clears throat> it's a really good film. Um, there are some technical aspects of it that are completely incorrect, actually, um, which is to do with the, the fact that the whole jury thing throughout the, um, the film was all based on uh, sort of having to be unanimous in guilty. Now, of course, under a common law court, it only takes one individual to be not guilty, to say not guilty, to pass a not guilty verdict. And the defendant is not guilty because it's all about, you know, reasonable doubt. Okay, and common law favours liberty. Yeah, but that wouldn't have made a very good film. <laughs> so, briefly, it was 12 of them. There was one guy on the jury to start with who wasn't happy about this information. It was, didn't seem right, didn't sit right with him at all. And all the others were prepared to convict and gradually, one by one, he got each one of them toppled over until eventually all of them went, well, you know, now you know the story. But it doesn't matter what, spoiler alert, it doesn't really matter what actually happened. It's the drama and it's the psychology and the emotion within it. All taking place in a jury room. That's it. There's hardly anything else in it. It's amazing. So do, do watch it because it's really all about the healing aspects of it. Oh, it's sort of slightly freezing. Hang on, let me just give it a... Okay, so, uh, natural law and the occulted body of knowledge. Okay, the occult. This is where people get a bit nervous and go, uh, oh no, we can't talk about that. That's just evil. <laughs> no, it's not. It just means it's hidden information. There's a body of knowledge... Um, on this planet that is, is the most concealed information. It's the information they really don't want you to know. Okay, forget chemtrails and all the other things and pharmaceutical drugs and all that. That's pretty lightweight stuff. This, they really don't want you to know about. Okay, this is deeper, esoteric information. Okay, so it might be an idea that you do know about it because then it levels the playing field. Okay, they don't want you to know because they keep that power to themselves and create a power differential over you. Okay, and precisely because they, um, that, that many people say, oh, I don't want to go into the occult, it's, uh, then that's, that's them uh, successfully mind programming you into not going there. Okay? So, esoteric knowledge. Now, natural law is all about the effects of the universe delivering back consequences of our actions. Okay, and it's very all deeply connected to the human psyche and the manipulation and mind control. Okay, now, natural law <clears throat> is at the, the heart of the occulted body of knowledge. It's at the nucleus. Okay, so in, if you're getting into natural law, and people throw out this term natural law, oh yeah, it's all about natural law, but they actually don't necessarily know about natural law, they haven't got into it. Okay, and it's a really deep subject, and it's fascinating. And it's going to take you on a journey. And it's not always a pleasant journey either. It's going to take you into your shadow work, it's going to take you into all kinds of things. <clears throat> it's at the heart of the occulted body of knowledge, along with some other things. Human psyche, as I've just said, Truth discovery, how to discover truth. Okay, uh, that would be, for example, learning about the trivium learning method, um, which is, um, <coughs> it, was, it was supposedly taught in um, quite high flying schools, maybe only in the top sets, but I don't think anymore, certainly not in the maintained sector. Um, they've dropped that one. But it's basically all about critical thinking. Um, yeah, I won't go into that now, but that's an important aspect. Uh, alchemy um, is a big thing. Uh, numerology uh, and the hermetic principles, which I'm going to go into a little bit as well, uh, among other things. Um, it's also about allegorical thinking. Okay, so not taking things literally. Okay, so, um, well, in fact, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment, actually, with a, uh, an example. A good one. 
So what is the ultimate aim in understanding the occult, uh, occult body of knowledge and, and natural law? It's about bringing ourselves into alignment with the universe and not living in opposition to it. So what does that mean? It means being real or authentic. That means not lying to yourself. Okay, being your self-master. And that's hard. It's really difficult. It's about understanding the three pillars of consciousness, which is thoughts, feelings, and actions. Okay, now the three pillars of consciousness is uh, represented by the trinity in religions. Okay, and the thoughts is the father, the masculine, the father. Um, the feeling is the mother, the feminine aspect. And then there's the giving birth. Those are marrying and giving birth to the male child. Always a male child is the action. Okay, and this is built into many mystical and, and religious um, texts as well. It's, understanding, it's about understanding numerology as well. And you can see that the, uh, the thoughts, feelings, and actions can, is also a representation in new, numerology. So the number of mankind right now is 666, okay, which, is, which is the state of consciousness that we are in now. We're already there. Okay, that's the condition or the mindset or the, or the state of consciousness that we are in now, society, generally. And we are aiming to be at the 777. Okay, and, and any, anyone who, who's uh, looked into numerology at a deeper level, you'll understand that the symbolic representation of some of these numbers, uh, you'll see in all kinds of things. Um, so the 777 is often associated with a, like a winning or a jackpot or something like that. You'll, they'll often put it on things like fruit machines and it's like the top number on. Um, Mark Passio talks about that as well, actually. The 777. And you'll see that number uh, out there as, as like the, the, the sort of the ultimate. You know? And actually, it's really just a, um, a state of consciousness that we need to reach. But they cheapened it, okay? By, by saying it's about a jackpot and a winning or something like that, yeah? So there's a twist there as well, yeah? The 888, okay, is the threefold infinity. So if you turn the eight on its side, it's the, it's the infinite, yeah? Unachievable in this realm. That's, a, that's a, you know, in the next, the next place that we go to, um, possibly achievable there. But uh, yeah, so the, the, this is, this, these are deep subjects, yeah? Um, so the opposite of truth, we need to go into that. Actually, I think we missed a slide. No, I don't think we have, actually. Maybe not. Um, so the truth is the universe. Okay, that is reality. That's what, what truth is. It's just what is. It's what has, is passing through the present and into the past. Now, humans have the ability to distort reality. We're quite good at it, actually. <clears throat> and um, we can do that by lying, and we can use our free will to do that. Okay, um, it isn't always bad, actually, to lie. Sometimes there are situations, maybe, which we could justify in doing that, and justify, actually, for good, good, good reason. Um, Jordan Peterson uh, talks about this in, in the, um, as the fabric of the universe. Okay, so the idea that the, the universe is a, is a material that's around us, and if you lie about something, you're basically taking that fabric of the universe around us and you're distorting it into a shape that it doesn't want to go into. You're just taking that reality and you're just changing it and forcing it into some form that it doesn't want to go into. And it's just going to snap back into, a, um, into the form that it wants to be in. And when it does that, it's not pleasant. It'll unravel. Yeah? And you hear that phrase, don't you, about the truth will always come out. The truth will always unravel, or whatever it is. Yeah, it always does. Because it's simply the universe returning into the natural form. Yeah? We are not big enough to say to the universe, I'm going to turn you into a different shape from what you are now. Okay? That's a bit arrogant. Yeah? It's not a good thing to be doing that. But we all do it all the time, of course. <clears throat> so lies... 
Uh, let's start to look at the nature of lying. Um, sounds a bit depressing, doesn't it? But actually, it's... By the way, to, the most... This whole light and love thing, okay? The most light and the most love thing is to get through the darkness and come out the other side. Face the darkness and the difficult stuff. And then when you come out the other side, it's great, it's fantastic, because you're processing a lot of stuff and you're healing. It's about healing. So this is, this is going into you know, things like the, the Carl Jung material uh, and, and shadow work. You know, how do you deal with your stuff and how do you really heal? Well, you go through all the dark stuff within you and face it again, which is really the hero's journey. It's what it's called. Yeah, exactly it. Yeah, so now lies, external and internal, which is possibly more dangerous. Okay, internal lies are the lies that we tell ourselves. Okay, when we, when we make ourselves believe something. So conditioning ourselves into believing something that isn't true, or the other way around. Okay, the fiction becomes a false reality. How many times are we doing that to ourselves? Okay, and, and we do it to ourselves not only individually, but we do it in the collective as well. As a society, if you think about it, there are popular beliefs in society. Well, we know that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah? <clears throat> so how do we do this? Because there are lots of different ways that we lie. Okay, we, we do it by exaggerating, exaggerations, playing things down, <coughs> glossing over something justifying something, we pretend and we make up reasons why we've taken a certain action. How many times do we do that? You know, well, I, I, I could do that or I could do that, you know, I, I, it's a bit uncomfortable, I'm going to do that. And you sort of make up extra reasons as to why you've taken that course of action. But you kind of know deep down, actually it's not really the reason, is it? if you're being honest with yourself. If you're being honest with yourself. See, that's the key. Yeah, and how, how often are we really, in a way, not honest with ourselves? So I'm including myself in this as well, don't worry. <laughs> so why do we do this? Because it's all about discomfort. It's about altering the truth because we won't face temporary discomfort. Isn't that? Yeah. That's what it's, it's all about that, really. And you get multi-layered distortions going on. One thing leads to another. <clears throat> and uh, there's an example, actually. This is to do with... Uh, oh, yeah, I'll just talk about this quickly. So um, it's sort of, sort of two things at the same time. Example, actually. Um, so sometimes we, um, we connect up with somebody. We get to know somebody for the first time. And when you first meet somebody, sometimes you're a little bit too giving of yourself because you're trying to impress a bit. And you're trying to be too nice. And uh, you're, you're, you've given too much of yourself away during that, that meeting. You've been a bit, you know, you've come to an agreement or something. And, uh, and you've just been a little bit too giving of yourself. Uh, and then what happens later is that you've set yourself on that course already. So you then meet that person again. And then you're having to do it again. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. And you've given too much of yourself away. And then suddenly you find yourself... Uh, actually just, just being too self-sacrificing in a relationship or whatever it is. And that can actually develop into something really bad, really serious. And, and you can have situations in families where this usually happens at Christmas or something like that, when the whole family's together and there's an absolutely unbelievable blow-up. <coughs> and one person, you know, somebody in the family has just lost it completely. And actually, really, that, that is just not, uh, not dealing with your own boundaries and, and self-sacrificing too much, and that's the ego. Yeah, and that's an example of that, where you've got layer upon layer upon layer, because it's a kind of lie about yourself, about how happy you are about a situation that you've created. And you're trying to convince yourself that, no, that's okay, I'll just do that, it's fine. And it's just more and more self-sacrifice piled on top of each other until your ego will just absolutely explode and you'll lose control. And that kind of thing does happen, doesn't it? I mean, we've seen it, you know? So that's an example of the sort of multi-layered distortion effect, but also about lying to yourself about things and about yourself. Um, it's uh, pretty destructive.
pretty destructive stuff. Karma. What is karma? Well, karma is consequence. That's delivered back to us by a dispassionate universe. It's not really punishment. Some people like to think, in religious terms, we think, oh, if you do that, it's bad. It's not bad, it's about learning. And it's about healing. Um, and so if, if something goes wrong and you've done something, you're just going to get flack back from the universe. It's just going to say, look, I don't mean it, it's just, that, that, there you go, there's you. <laughs> it's, that's the effect of what, you, of what you've done. Yeah, and I think that's a more helpful way of thinking about that, personally. It's merely, really, about mishandling the universe or screwing around pretending consensus is truth. It's not the same thing. Yeah, consensus is just the popular belief about something. It's the pervading wisdom, if you like, which isn't necessarily wisdom at all. Yeah? <clears throat> Here we go. So... In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. George Orwell, good one. Never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. The great American author William Fulton, that's a good one, that, isn't that? But actually, this is really important, this one, interesting. Because this is about standing on the sidelines and not saying anything and standing up for truth. Because that's bad as well. That's going against natural law. How many times have we done that? The truth will set you free, but first it will make you miserable. <laughs> so it's the dark and light, you see. Yeah, it's, it's everything together. And, okay, so the hermetic principles, this is, I was, said I was going to come on to that, okay, so this is a little bit more um, about, the, about natural law and the occult. Now, you can't align yourself without the examination of the macro and the micro. So this is to do with the major and the minor arcanas. Okay, so the macro, that's everything that's really <coughs> big in the universe, is what's called the major arcana. And the minor arcana is the micro. That's about oneself. Okay, and it's really about examining how we function in relation to the universe. So how we, as the micro, functioning in relation to the big things in the universe. Okay, so it's all about patterns and tendencies of the universe and us and our interrelation between them. Okay, it's a science, natural law. It's not a religious belief. It's a science. But it's, it's the science of human and intelligent relations. That's in a sense what it is. So examples of four of the hermetic principles. I think there are actually seven. Um, and uh, I'll just pick four. So um, cause and effect we've already talked about. There is no cause without an, effect, without an effect, of course, and there's no effect without a cause. Okay, so there's no randomness in the universe. Nothing happens by chance. Okay, because basically the universe is a complex system. Um, cause and effect. Gender. Wow, what's that about? We sort of hinted at that already, okay? So gender is um, about masculine and feminine consciousness in society. Sometimes it's equated to the left and right side of the brain, but people say that it's sort of not really about that anymore, and that brain science has moved on a bit. Um, but it doesn't really matter, it's still the same concept. Okay, and um, the masculine consciousness is really about what is provable, it's about detail, it's about extrapolating uh, the detail and proving something. Okay, and it's also about what's, I, th I think anyway, it's got what's gone through the the present and into the past. It's about what's provable. Okay, and that's, that's the masculine. And the feminine is more about possibility. It's about pattern recognition. It's about the, the big picture. And uh, emotions and, and possibility, all of that. Um, in a way, if you like, the magic. 
And the reason why it's the magic is because it, you can't quite put your finger on it because nothing's ha it hasn't happened yet. It, there's lots of possibility there. Yeah, and so, um, for example, the, the, the circle shapes within uh, sacred geometry is the feminine, and the straight lines and the straight edges is the masculine. You can see how this fits together, yeah? Um, now, the interesting thing in, in, in psychology is that if you are too in the masculine thinking, then you are very controlling, and you become limited in your thinking, and you, be, you go into fear, and it's all about, um, uh, it's, well, you're thinking from your reptilian brain. Okay, so that's the state that government is in. Because <laughs> they're in control. It's all about control. Fear and control, yeah, are very much linked. Yeah, and so, so that's that, that sort of pervasive thinking about government is, is that. Uh, whereas the feminine, if you're in the feminine side, you're all about that magic of possibility, blue sky thinking. Um, yeah, but sometimes if you're too much in the feminine side, you can become gullible. You can be, you can be all about, you know, possibility, but nothing ever really manifests. Yeah. So you need that grounding of the masculine with the magic possibility of the feminine. You need the, the, to integrate those two together. Yeah. Absolutely key, that. That's gender. Correspondence. Um, correspondence is about the big and the small. What happens on the, on the big is reflected in the small, and what's in the small is reflected in the big. And you see that in sacred geometry, um, geometric patterns in the universe. You'll see amazing shapes in the big, and you'll see those same amazing shapes in the tiny. Yeah? And the universe operates like that. These are the kinds of patterns that we have to recognize, because you'll see that in behaviors. That's the behaviours in society are reflected in yourself. Know thyself and you know the universe. So you can apply these principles into everyday life as well. And when you start seeing these patterns and these allegories, you start to get really wise to what's happening about yourself and in the universe. And duality is um, the idea that there are no real opposites. So it's a little bit like the concept of hot and cold. Yeah, we think of them as opposites, but they're not really opposites. It's just, um, it's just cold is a bit less heat. Yeah, and it's on a scale, and where does one flip to the other? And Yeah, they're actually the same thing. Yeah, and there are loads of things like that um, in, in life generally, uh, concepts as well. So, lies, contradictions, and double think. Okay, these are examples of the kinds of jarring, bizarre sentences and things that uh, can... Uh, so this one's great. A lady takes her mask off to sneeze. Okay, so this is all about... So this lying is in a way about contradictions and, and double think is about this idea of applying a principle in one compartment of your life but not applying it consistently right across. It's kind of a lie, really. But, you're, but these are the sorts of sentences that are going to get you to spot them. Which is why I love memes. I'm always going on about memes. And that's why they're important. Because they're jarring. They get the people who are screwed up with this lying thinking. And they're getting them to start spotting the inconsistencies and the contradictions in their worldview. It'll start showing the cracks in their thinking in their ideologies, yeah? So a lady takes off her mask to sneeze. Beautiful, fantastic. My tinfoil hat was more effective than your mask. That's a little bit smug. We've got to be a bit careful about not, not to be smug about these things. So I wouldn't go out there and say that to people. Oh, you would. <laughs> but I can say it to you. <laughs> Trouble is it's going out on YouTube, but it's just... To, to me, what's interesting is not the thing that's being said. It's, the, it's there's just a beautiful thing in that, isn't there? Um, and I, ca I came out with that one earlier. There's no virtue in simply doing what you're told. It's not really a contradiction, but it's just one of those sentences that really gets you thinking, you know? Voting. I came out with that one earlier. Giving grown adults the illusion of control. <laughs> 
Oh, this is awful, this one. Showing your vaccine status on the way into a remembrance service. <laughs> Just think about that one for a moment. Show me your papers, please. Oh yes, my body, my choice. Okay, this was interesting. So I'm not making uh, any comments particularly on the abortion issue one way or the other. It's not about that. It was just last summer, it was very funny, when during this abortion issue that was coming up in America, how many people got hot under the collar about my body, my choice. <laughs> and we just had the whole, you know, vaccine thing. Um, it was just beautiful. That kind of thing. It's, this is what we're talking about. Yeah, Consistency, consistent application of principle. You know, people really showing off about, oh, my principle is that we never do that, or whatever it is. And then there's another compartment of their life where they do exactly that. Yeah, it's just really important to spot that in oneself first. Yeah, and constantly test your principles and see if you're actually applying that across, across the board. Oh dear, here we go. <laughs> Talking about common law and then going off and doing admiralty letter processes. Sorry, I know that's a bit unpopular. That would probably be... Okay, so admiralty letter processes, which is all this, this, this business about doing UCC and uh, straw man stuff and getting into those processes. I'm, not, I'm just giving that side of the common law movement a bit of a hard time at the moment because I'm trying to reposition this movement into the context of constitutional law. Stop going into their systems, okay, and, and doing letter writing processes just to deal with your parking fine or whatever it is. Yeah, it's not about that. It's about holding the government's feet to the fire morally, okay, and stop obfuscating and confusing the issue. Call them out, yeah, over in the proper system where they're meant to be, yeah. So I, I use that because it's just, it's just a, yeah, it's another contradiction of, of our movement, actually, if I'm being honest. Flying to Davos in a plane. Yeah. <laughs> I think we know what all that's about, don't we? <laughs> Is that it? Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a slightly awkward one. Taking a lateral flow test to go into venues. Sorry. I know it's difficult, shouldn't have done it, because if enough people had stood their ground, I, a job is different, job is, I, I get it, you know, if you're about to lose your job on it, I mean, I do, I actually just, in my job, I, I actually wrote a letter to the boss and I said, I'm not taking a lateral flow test, I can, and I could fake it as well, and lots of people do, but I'm not doing it, I'm calling the situation out for what it really is. And I know that's hard in certain situations, variably, for different people. I get that. But going into a venue for a concert or something and just faking an LF test, give me a break. Sorry, but it's, you know, that, no, definitely not. Anyway, conclusion and summary before we get on to the um, Q&A, because we'll, we'll, we'll need some questions and things like that. The Constitution was constructed properly for us, and it is the tool by which we are supposed to solve our slavery problem. It was there for us, and we've not used it. Okay, the freedom movement has been remiss in just ignoring it completely. And it is there. We just need to understand it and embrace it again. Okay, we've forgotten that it's even there, and we'll need to relearn its power. It's going to be about educating first to build numbers and knowledge, and then we'll issue challenges at that point. There's no point in issuing challenges yet, because they're safe in the knowledge that most people out there will not support us. Okay, it's the fact that most people are happy with the status quo. And that's a difficult thing to hear. Today's been about difficult truths, yeah? But it's, a, it's really about you guys learning about constitutional law. You know, when you say, I'm going to learn about common law, you're not learning about common law unless you're learning the Constitution. 
Okay, do you know what the Articles of 12, in 1215 Magna Carta are called? The Articles of Common Law. Your constitution is built on common law. So whenever anyone talks about common law, stop talking about the straw man stuff. You should be talking about the constitution because that is what limits government. Okay, I should have actually said at some point, I must have missed a slide somewhere, I think. Um, but one of the things that I, I just want, wanted to say, because I, I, I sort of went off on a bit of a challenge, uh, a bit, sorry, a bit of a journey, I should say, on this, because I came a bit of an anarchist in the free sense. And I thought, we don't want a state at all. You know, we don't want any kind of state or any kind of nation. You know, we just want to be a free, walking anarchist. And since then, I've returned... Because I've realised that an, an organic nation is a self, sorry, a safe masculine container for that anarchism of the people. You can be an anarchist, but safely contained within the, within the organic nation. Okay, it's about the original mapping that was done, and the boundaries, and marking the ground, and putting down your masculine boundaries as a nation. Now, if you think about the shamanic traditions of the world, the free wandering, what the ones that we always think, oh, we just want a free, a f just to be completely free anarchists. But where are they now? Yeah, many of them have been inf infiltrated, taken apart, all the rest of it, because they didn't map their land. They didn't apply the expression, the masculine containment expression. And, and that's where I've returned back to the nation. As long as the nation has a democratic constitution at its heart, that's a common law constitution, with trial by jury, allowing the people to be the final arbiter of law, then what all you're really doing is saying, right, the government gets to be limited over here in this corner, and everybody else just to get, gets to do what they want. That's basically what you're saying, okay? And just to recap very quickly, the Constitution boils down into three things. It's really easy. It's some kind of natural law tribunal that allows the people to decide on the edges of the acceptable behaviour of their community, their liberties. That's the first thing. It's easy. You can express that. The second thing is that you have some kind of wise elder who promises in perpetuity to keep that in place. And also, uh, if you are, in the third thing, going to create um, a legislature of any sort where they can create statutes, which is just that flagging up exercise. If you're going to create those, they must be in alignment with the, the laws and customs and they must, be, um, must always go before that tribunal. And the head of state or that wise elder must never allow those statutes to pass onto the statute books if they do infringe on those liberties and on those um, common law customs. That's it. That's it. That's all the Constitution is. And that's going to be the same in some tribe in South America as it is in a complex state like this. Can a complex state like this actually function like this? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to find out. <laughs> And it might not be the case, in which case it just has to be all smaller again. But maybe that's a good thing. Less centralisation, and then we're not as distant from the processes. We bring them closer to ourselves, and maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Sacred geometry would teach us that, by the way. Yeah? So, educate first and think about it deeply. And then teach others, and then we'll issue challenges when there's big numbers and big noise out there. Yeah. And can I please urge you to throw this around all over social media. Yes. It's not happening yet to the, to the level I'd like to see it. Yeah. yeah, and that means over the other side. It means commenting under YouTube videos, under articles. It means putting it everywhere. And then it means when you see other people doing it on their Twitter account or their Facebook account, it means going over where they've done it and liking it and sharing it. Just do 10 minutes of that every day all over social media. That's your homework on social media. At least you're then not just being idle yeah. on social media. You're using social media consciously. At this.
It needs to become a national conversation. And if it doesn't, I don't think there's anything left. I'm being honest. It's got to happen. There you go. That's, that's me over.